Now, this is the mic, obviously. Yeah, I got to turn and, it on. Uh, you've got it where you want it? I think so, yeah. Okay. Can I make a statement before I start to read this? Well, I'm, I'm going to do an introduction and then you can... Oh, okay. okay. And then if, you know, however you think you want to handle it. I, I think you can just... You'll just be able to... You can start reading right here, like most. What, what I wanted to say is that my purpose in having written this is because there's no way I could have remembered all this detail. Good point. So over a period of time, as I wrote the different sections, they came back, it came back to me. This Veterans History Project interview is being conducted on Tuesday, March the 4th in the year 2008 uh, at the Niles Public Library. My name is Neil O'Shea. I'm a member of the reference staff here at the Niles Public Library and I'm speaking with Mr. Ralph Friedman. We're sitting here in the group study room on the second floor. Um, Mr. Friedman was born on May 12th, uh, 1917, and he has kindly consented to be interviewed for this project. Um, Mr. Friedman uh, prepared uh, a statement for purposes of this interview today, um, which he's going to uh, read into the record uh, when we come to that portion of the interview which deals with military service. Um, we appreciate Mr. Friedman taking the time to uh, refine that statement and uh, execute uh, another draft so that it's uh, rich in details that might not be available for recall at, at one time. But in the time that he spent preparing for this interview, he's, uh, he's developed a statement which is as accurate in detail as possible, and the, uh, the Veterans History Project appreciates it. Um, so, um, Mr. Friedman, if I may begin, um, uh, let's see, the first question you usually ask is, when did you enter the service? Um, um, I entered in two phases. I enlisted in 1942 and entered into um, a teaching project in which I taught some basic electronics because I had been a ham radio operator since I was 13 years old. I was qualified to do this and I was hired by civil service on a short-term basis in what was called the electronic reserve. Uh, that was an the spring of 1942. So you would have been about 25, 24, 25 years of age? I guess so. Yeah. yeah. So were you living in Chicago at that time? Yes, I was a married man, recently married, living in Chicago, and uh, I had completed some college classes before going to work and the uh, employment situation then was such that I was considered a desirable employee because of my background in electronics and I worked in what were then called radio factories. Mr. Freeman, what high school did you graduate from in Chicago? Crane Technical High School. Oh, yeah. My last reunion was about five years ago, and we suspended them. We had reunion for years and years. I graduated in 1935. So your neighborhood, was that on the west side, or...? Yeah, the west side. Uh, my home neighborhood is the Lawndale District, which has now been retitled um, 
I guess North Lawndale. So that had been like Madison and. Well, uh, closer to Douglas Park. Douglas Park and yeah, Madison. right near Douglas Park. So um, you wound up in the um, the Air Force, the Army Air Force. Um, yes. Yes, it was the uh, the Signal Corps, which was a branch, a lesser branch of the United States Army Air Force. So when you began, when you began your um, active duty, yeah, I'm just trying to connect the dots here in my mind. In '42, you're in the civilian or civil service. Yeah, and I was teaching teaching the, teaching the class in what today would be called basic electronics. And those students were servicemen in all branches of the service, or uh, no, they were uh, they were enlisted in the electronics reserve, which enabled them to not go into the army immediately and undergo training such as mine and further training in Philadelphia at Philco and RCA Signal Corps schools. So were you, so were you teaching in Chicago? In Chicago I taught. In Philadelphia I was a, a student. And I completed that in the early part of 1943 and was called to active duty by the by the by the army by the army so you wasn't for you it was never a question of like I would rather have been in the Navy no versus the army I made or, that choice by going in enlisted reserve which meant I could be um, categorized for the signal corps and you chose that because of your background in electronics. Yeah, ham radio. Ham radio. Did you did you do well in high school in science courses or? Yes, I did. I did. Uh, I was in um, college for one year in a pre-engineering course, but it just wasn't in the cards for me to continue in schooling. I had to get a job. Yeah. What college was that? Was it uh, Medill Junior College? It had previously been Medill High School, and it was in the vicinity of Thirteenth and uh, Ashland, different Chicago than today. So you teach for a while in Chicago, then they move you to Philadelphia, and you're teaching, or you're taking courses in taking Philadelphia. courses in, in more advanced equipment, which was classified as secret equipment. It, it was uh, um, the pr predecessor of radar. Well, that must have been kind of interesting for you, or oh, to be on the cutting was, edge, so to speak, these new developments. Much newer. Yeah. So it's in Philadelphia. Is it in Philadelphia then that you called up to active duty then, or? Uh, uh, when I left Philadelphia, I came back to Chicago for the express purpose of going into active duty. Uh, not necessarily my choice, this was the government's, the Army's plan. So, um, was that the first time you'd ever been out of Chicago, was it, when you were to Philadelphia, or? I don't think so. No, I don't think so. Um, I had been born in New York and had family there, and I guess I had been east on a few occasions. So your horizons were probably a little broader than um, many of the vets that, that Maybe, started yeah, then. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, a lot of the guys were neighborhood kids yeah. and had never gone out of town yeah. at all. And you uh, you adjusted pretty well to the uh, had no routine, trouble. no trouble at all. No trouble. Yeah. I was married already by the time I went to Philadelphia. Yeah. So my wife came with me. Oh, so that was that was was less of a hardship than if you have your wife with yeah. you. And, yeah. That's right. Yeah. But then when you were called up to active, then she had to return to 
Chicago. We, we both returned to Chicago, and I took off and went to various places for active training, which yeah, well, I will be reading into the record. Yeah, I think this is a maybe this is the time in the interview when we should turn it over fully to you, uh, and if you wanted to uh, read your uh, okay. statement here, I think it would. Uh, okay, I titled this account name, rank, and serial number for the most appropriate uh, reasons. My name is Ralph B. Friedman, F-R-I-E-D-M-A-N. I was a tech sergeant in the U.S. Army. My serial number was 16071394. I was in the 5th Air Force in the Southwest Pacific and we were the seventh service group of the and the 1098 signal company. Like most of over 10 million veterans who served in World War II, we not only did what we were trained to do, but as soldiers we did what we were told to do. This will be an account of my outfit service in 1943, 1944, and 1945 under General Douglas MacArthur. Our men received their basic training at camps located all over the United States. Many of us were singled out for specific aptitudes and sent to Signal Corps schools before being assigned to our unit at Camp Custer in Battle Creek, Michigan. We soon shipped to Westfield, Massachusetts, which is near Springfield, for five months of field training. Electronic specialists served parts of that time at Bradley Field, Connecticut, and other East Coast air bases, installing radio and radar in P-47 planes bound for the Southwest Pacific. In October 1943, we were activated for overseas duty, and on November 1st, we left San Francisco on a former Dutch luxury cruise ship, the New Amsterdam, landing on November 15th at the Pacific Ocean port of Wellington, New Zealand. We disembarked in wool, olive drab uniforms, in that warm, in that New Zealand warm weather, with gas masks, rifles, and other combat equipment, we were marched across the peninsula and the city to a port on the Tasman Sea, on the western side, where we boarded the same ship and pulled up anchor for Australia. In retrospect. It appears that this was our general's way of saying the Yanks are coming. At that time, Australia was being attacked by Jap planes from Glauber Canal in the Solomon Islands, just east of Papua, New Guinea. On November 19th, we landed in Sydney, Australia, and moved north by train to Brisbane's Camp Doombin. Our radio radar section was assigned to the air base to remove the radio and radar equipment we had installed just months before because the Australians used different frequencies. We then installed the appropriate IFF, which is identification friend or foe, throughout the remainder of 1943. This was important because these P-47s were escorting our bombers striking Guadalcanal. In early February 1944, we were moved by plane to Port Moresby, Papua, Australian New Guinea, and then flown northwest to Sador to install U.S. air traffic control equipment at the newly captured airstrip. We got our baptism by fire by nightly air raids. Every night the moon was out. In early May 1944, 
we boarded an LST landing ship tank for what proved to be an uneventful landing at Hollandia, Dutch New Guinea, which was considered secure enough to become the Southwest Pacific headquarters for General MacArthur. Once more, on May 31, 1944, we were loaded on an LST, this time as part of an invasion force headed for a Jap stronghold on Biak on Dutch New Guinea. Part of the Shooten Islands, this was only 900 miles from the Philippines, where General MacArthur had earlier pledged, I shall return. When we arrived on June 6, 1944, that was D-Day on France, we found that the U.S. infantry was fiercely opposed on the beachhead by Japan's tanks and then from hillside caves above the beach. The Japs had installed long guns on rails, zeroed in on the road to the airfield. After firing, the long guns pulled back into the caves like turtles pulling back into their shells. The road to the airport was impassable, blocked with wrecked U.S. jeeps and trucks. Our LSD circled offshore, waiting for the infantry to secure a beachhead. Our troops on the LSD were ultimately put down in the surf to unload <coughs> drums of aviation gas, bombs, and ammo. Although though we were supposed to carry out technical missions like stringing up telephone lines, setting up air traffic control for fighter planes supporting infantry, setting up a, crowded, a coded message center for Air Force Command, repairing and installing radio and radar in planes at the airstrip. However, for now, we were just support troops. <coughs> Shoot. Eventually, our LSD jammed in between others, sprawled on the beach like alligators with gaping jaws. Their drop ranks disgorging vehicles, troops, and endless crates of equipment. Our first sergeant had a few men drive our trucks ashore stringing them out along the base of the hills to establish a company perimeter, leaving space around the mess sergeant's tr truck for feeding the troops. The rest of the men unloaded till it got dark, when truck lights were banned to avoid giving Jap bombers an easy target. As usual, the first sergeant had things well in hand. He was regular army in his early 30s, with cold blue eyes and a square jaw that didn't invite debate. His, clear, his carefully clipped speech, however, spoke less of the mud of infantry or the manure of cavalry than of a headquarters orderly room. As a consequence, some of our country boys made snide remarks about his sexual orientation out of his presence, but it was hard to imagine a homosexual regular army first sergeant. Exhausted, that night the men slept in, on, or under the trucks, with the guards posted along the perimeter. When the Jap bombers came over, they ran to an abandoned Jap bomb shelter made of rice bags. Dislodging, dislodging gigantic rats feeding on the rice spilled on the ground. With the road to the airfield blocked on the second day, the first sergeant gave assignments to some non-coms. As a staff sergeant at that time, I was given an eight-man squad to go out to the infantry front lines to relieve some men who had had no sleep for a few nights. We were assigned four foxholes, 
two men to a position as perimeter guards. An infantry corporal showed us how to rig trip wires with tin cans as alarms across paths in from the jungle. We were told when it got dark we were not to speak, smoke, or get out of the foxhole, even to urinate. Above all, we were to fire at anything that moved on the path. When it got dark with only a part of the moon, it was hard to make out anything. Well past midnight on my shift, the tin can jingled. I could barely make out a dark form wriggling along the path to our foxhole. Realizing that the flash from the muzzle of my gun would disclose our position and earn us a well-tossed grenade in response, I waited for exactly the right moment to fire. Suddenly, I saw the prone figure rise and my finger made the decision for me. I heard a yelp of pain and then nothing. My foxhole partner didn't move or speak, but after some time he poked me and mentioned that he would take over. It was a very long night and I didn't sleep, but when the dawn came, so did the corporal, who wanted to see what had happened. After searching the area, he decided that the Japs had sent a scout dog down the path to probe the perimeter. Since they always repeat retrieved their dead and wounded, we would never know. He patted me on the shoulder indulgently and said, you did good, Sergeant. When the rested men returned to their forward position, we were free to return to our own company. It was still early in the day and we were surprised to find the company gathered in an area near the beach where large coral rocks formed a natural seating area for the men. Note, the following incident, which occurred on the beachhead on the previous night, when my squad was away on infantry assistance, consists of third-party testimony when we were not present. Therefore, the names have been changed in the interest of fairness. However, this incident did occur as reported in our presence. The previous night brought the Jap bombers on another run while most of the company was asleep. Old Man Staley was awakened and got up for piss call, moving away from where the others were sleeping to the nearest palm tree at the foot of the hill, just inside the company perimeter. He was startled by loose stones tumbling down the slope so he froze behind the palm. Though it was dark, it was a dark night, he could recognize First Sergeant Michael, but not his companion, emerging from the vegetation. That morning when he told the story to his buddies, it spread through the company and was picked up by Tech Sergeant Kelly, who rounded up other non-coms. They decided that the commanding officer should hear about it for the good of the outfit. However, he would just happen by and learn details without taking part. When the meeting assembled, I noticed that the first sergeant was not present. Kelly stood up and said, there are times when everybody has to pull together. This is not a time for personal feelings or desires. You may have heard rumors about the first sergeant in the past. This is different. Breaching our perimeter at night in combat conditions endangered the company. The person who did that should not be in charge. Since we don't get the vote in this man's army, all we can do is bring out the facts. Kelly then asked old man Staley to tell what he saw. Staley stuck strictly to the facts and offered no conclusions. Others, however, eagerly told of past incidents involving the first sergeant 
in allegations of homosexuality. Not one word was said in his defense, or for that matter, about the alleged companion. As if on cue, a tropical rainstorm blew in from the ocean and the meeting broke up, since there was really nothing more to say. When the storm ended, the men returned to, the un to unloading LSDs. That afternoon, when they got back, they were told the first sergeant was on sick leave and that Master Sergeant McCoy was acting first sergeant. The next day, our P-47s, our P-47s, dive bomb mouths of the hillside caves with aviation gas and burnt the enemy out, destroying the long guns. The road to the airfield was now open, and it was time for Signal Corps work. Weeks later, McCoy was named first sergeant. Also, since his master sergeant stripes were now open, Tech Sergeant Kelly became a master sergeant. Ernie Mayhoff was, on it, was being discharged for the good of the service. In July 1944, an airstrip on nearby Oe Island was activated by the 5th Air Force, and our service group was told to provide a radio and radar facility. I headed a six-man detachment with a mobile repair van, and we remained there through November of 1944. We received a commendation for our work, and I became a tech sergeant. On January 17, 1945, we were loaded on a Liberty ship for the invasion of Luzon, Philippine Islands. We landed in Subic Bay on February 10th and followed the invasion force as support troops through the mountains to Clark Field and Manila. Our occupation was peaceful and we got five day passes into Manila. The war was closing in on Japan and we were shipped via LST to Okinawa where the Japs were reduced to suicide bombings. We were stationed at Naha Airfield on a hillside seven miles from Iwo Jima in time to watch the Japanese peace envoys land. We also were in time for the typhoon season and endured Two. But the war was over. On November 20th, as occupation troops, we were shipped to Japan. In Fukuoka, a few of our low point men helped restore a telephone exchange, but largely we huddled around oil drums, heating bombed out factories, waiting for the ride home. On the way home, we saw Hiroshima. On December 10th, we boarded a troop ship, USS General William Weigel, in Yokohama. Arriving in Tacoma, Washington on December 20th, 1945. And in January of 46, we were dispersed to our home states. Epilogue. We were very lucky. No lives lost. I got malaria and we had one trivial purple heart. The most important service occurred under our original first sergeant, although he left under a cloud. There are those who say it was army politics. I'll drink to that. Interesting. Yeah. Was so. So, Mr. Friedman, um, everybody must have been delighted when the war ended. Huh? Everybody must have been delighted when the war was over, right? Oh, you bet. Was there a great celebration? Yeah, it was probably our biggest celebration of all. Uh, I still remember the all the planes that were based on Okinawa were doing aerial aerobatics overhead, flying upside down 
all kind of mock battles. You know, what a show it was. But of course, those guys were young guys too, and they were just all expressing the feelings we had. Uh, I mentioned that the peace convoys had flown into Aishima. That was a little island seven miles across the ocean. So you were you were discharged from the service then uh, at 46 in January 46. And that was in Fort Sheridan or uh, uh, for, yeah you're right it was Fort Sheridan I didn't mistake that we came back by train from Tacoma we came back to Fort Sheridan and we were processed for health and and uh, paperwork and all for a few days and discharged. Of course, my wife at that time of six years, my wife of six years, and I were reunited. And, uh, and you hadn't seen her in a couple of years, right? No. Yeah. yeah. Not from 43 on. Did you get letters exchanged pretty oh, often? Yeah. yeah. There was some. I think it was called female. Yeah. There were. It was a form of letters that got processed by copies, and they were very short little forms. And yes, we corresponded. Yeah. So of course, we didn't get the mail right when away. it was written. No. Or, no, we get packed this thick of letters. Did um, so when you. You discharged here in the Chicago area. Did you have a, a difficult time readjusting to civilian life? Um, there was no work for me. No, I don't believe there was. But I didn't mind. <laughs> and I hung around. Oh, we had no apartment. We had subleased an apartment for two months. A couple was on um, vacation in Florida, and we knew somebody who knew somebody, and we got that apartment to live in. And somebody else we knew knew of an apartment for rent, but there was a $500 bribe to be paid just to get the apartment. But we took it. It was a lovely apartment on Logan Boulevard near Western. And we took that and stayed there till 1950. So that would be oh no, beyond 1950, 1954. So we stayed there a number of years. Yeah, there was difficulty getting adjusted. Oh, I did find work, and that was no trouble. Was that in your electronics? Uh, yeah, uh, line. I, I went to work for. Um, the predecessor of what became Hudson Ross, a radio and electronics chain in downtown Chicago. And I was, the store I worked for was across from the LaSalle Hotel, and I sold that equipment. Um, did you, uh, did you avail yourself of the GI Bill at all, or did they? No. No. Married and Intending, oh, my wife was very sick. Uh, she had a dreadful cancer on her adrenal gland and was having a blood pressure in excess of 250, and a young girl. And so it wasn't in the cards for me to entertain any ideas like that. Did you um, did you stay in contact with some of your war, your buddies after the war a little bit? Oh, yes, yeah. all of them, as many as I could. Yes, uh, we stayed in contact and had a number of reunions through the years. Um, and I guess we're down to the point now. There are only eight or nine of us alive 
and the thought of a reunion isn't practical anymore. So, uh, Mr. Friedman, you you um, you reached the, the rank of um, tech, sergeant. tech sergeant. That was an accomplishment, wasn't it, to become a tech sergeant? Um, yeah. Were you a corporal before you left the United yeah, States? I, uh, yes, I was. Uh, I was called a T5, which is a technical corporal. And I was a technical corporal in one of my... Oh, I even got to be a buck sergeant in Massachusetts uh, because I would be over some squads of men doing the installation in airplanes. We were working on the airplanes and the, inf the equipment would be provided by the signal corps and we were told to put it in certain planes destined for the South Pacific. And that was a kind of a, an irony that they had us put the wrong equipment in it for Australia. When we got to Australia, the, the planes were useless. I'm sorry, the equipment was useless because Australia operated on a whole different set of frequencies. Yeah. So you were a, you were a sergeant already when you were in, uh, in BIAC. Oh, yeah. In BIAC, I was a staff sergeant. Yeah, yeah. I, I went went from corporal in the states to sergeant in the states, and overseas I went to staff sergeant, and then ultimately just before the year before we went home, I got to be a tech sergeant. That um, the incident where you um, pulled the trigger. Yeah. Did you? you what did you shoot? I really don't know. The, the uh, U.S. corporal said the Japs were very, what's the word, um, consistent. They retrieved wounded, dead, whatever. And even if it, it was a patrol dog. A dog. Like, even if it was a patrol or like dog, a dog. Yeah. They would have retrieved it. Mm. And he said, you did good, Sergeant, meaning that anything that crossed that path had to be headed off. Even a patrol dog would have a purpose in filtrating into our area, show them that they could follow. They could send a whole squad after that dog. Yeah, so they, um, made, they made use of dogs. To oh, yeah. sort of probe or uh, as a probe, yeah. yeah, yeah, and were they like German shepherds or some indistinct breed? Or, yeah, I think they would have been of that type of a breed. Yeah, yes. that's interesting. Yeah, I know. I've never never heard of that. So, uh, so I don't know. I fired in anger, but I don't know if I shot a person or a dog. An irony. The. Um, so in looking back, how do you think your service in the military uh, and the experiences uh, affected your life? I wasn't a very mature person. I think it matured me. Yes. Did the... Um, did your military? Do you think your military service has influenced your thinking about war, or about the military and its place in society? I don't remember ever feeling that I was in a wrong war, as the way these poor kids might feel today. I don't remember feeling that way. I felt we were doing what we needed to do in defense of our country. And there was also the factor that being Jewish, I had long hated Hitler 
in the Nazis and retribution in any way I could was important. So I think, uh, no, I don't think it, I had an adverse feeling after that. Some of the young uh, Jewish veterans that I interviewed, they did encounter some degree of anti-Semitism in the, in the ranks. Did you have to confront that or live Min with it? Or? I did, but it was minimal. Uh, by and large, the Signal Corps men had a higher intelligence level in order to adapt to that type of work. But not all of them were technicians. A lot of them were just, you know, the guys who did the train work, did the cooking, and they were just soldiers. But we didn't have a, we didn't have a, a large anti-Semitic, uh, a large feeling of anti-Semitism, no. It, it seems like the the key the key factor in all of this was your your abilities uh, as a, in as an electronic as a ham radio operator and your love for uh, for electronics. Yeah. In your case, the army really. Uh, and I had a leadership ability too. Utilized your aptitudes, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I had better technicians than me in my group. But I think I exhibited leadership, which is what the Army used in giving you that rank. And you needed it because you, when I went out with these squads, I was the boss. I had to make all the decisions. Did you ever have a, an opportunity to uh, examine Japanese radios or? Uh, oh, sure. What did you think of their technology or approach? Their technology was excellent. Their technology was excellent. Um, I don't know if they got it from the Germans, but the German technology was also wonderful. Um, I would have to say that the best of all those countries was leading the way in the technology. You know. Behind the army, there were all of these scientists and factory engineers who were doing all of this. There was a long, there was a lot more to it than just the soldiers. We were just the ultimate users. Yeah. Um, is there anything you would like to add to the interview that you haven't uh, covered, so that we haven't covered to this point? I'd like to add my appreciation for the fact that the Library of Congress and the United States government sees fit to record our experiences before we're gone. I think that's a very um, satisfying measure. Well, thank you, Mr. Friedman, for a valuable uh, memoir. And you thank ended you. it on a perfect note. <laughs> thank you, sir. Uh, let me ask, can you tell if it was recording? There oh, were I times so. I had my page of paper in between. Yeah, we've got it both ways here. Um, okay. But the, this statement is a little different than this one. Oh yes, oh, wait, right. I mean the one, the original one you sent me. Oh yes, yes. Yeah. I shortened it. You did. Page, yeah. But and I also altered some of the emphasis. Yes. On uh, after the war, the reunions right. and all of that. The. Uh, so in looking back, how do you think your service in the military? Uh, and the experiences uh, affected your life. 